Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Driving Revenue, the New Field Service Imperative. I'm Sarah Nicastro, Editor-in-Chief of Field Technologies, and I'll be moderating today's event. Today, Dave Hart, former Vice President of European Service at Pitney Bowes and current Vice President of Global Customer Transformation at ServiceMax, is going to share with you some incredibly valuable information to help you be ready to grow your bottom line in 2014. Vidya Chidaga, Director of Product Marketing at ServiceMax, will then give you an overview of some of the technological tools available today to help you accomplish the goal of driving revenue. We'll hold a question and answer session after Dave and Vidya's presentations, but feel free to submit questions as we go along. We'll get to as many as possible during the Q&A, and any we can't get to will be followed up on after today's event. Also, to give you a heads up, we're going to be asking you one quick poll question during today's presentation, so please keep an eye out for that. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dave to begin today's session. Today's session. Dave? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed. And um, You're well, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks for joining us. So just to give you a brief introduction, who is Dave Hart? Well, I was a guy who was a service engineer in 1987. I was out there on the tools uh, fixing uh, photocopiers and printers and that kind of equipment. So I was a service engineer for six years before I went into a middle management position. Some would say arguably one of the toughest places in the world to be. As they say, pressure only heads down, but I guess in that middle management position, it heads both up and down in any organizations. And I held various management positions, including setting up a service organization in the Republic of Ireland, before ultimately I joined the Piggy Bowes organization in the year 2000. So I troubleshooted some large unprofitable accounts for them in their management services division. And then latterly in 2007, I was promoted to the UK service director with 145 staff and a budget of over $50 million. And then latterly into a, a leadership role, a high-level service leadership role, where I was a director of service for the European business running an $80 million budget and ultimately promoted to vice president running a $200 million thousand people service operation across Europe. And in 2011, I became uh, ServiceMax's largest customer. We instigated the, uh, the deployment of ServiceMax for over 900 technicians across Europe. So I'd like to argue that I've worked for a global organization. I understand cultural differences in many organizations, and I probably understand more than anybody some of the budget constraints that some of you service leaders obviously have to put up with every day. So let's talk about what I'm going to talk about today. I want to briefly talk through three areas that I've seen that I think will believe, I believe that will help companies drive revenue gains. And for me, those can be categorized really in how you utilize your greatest assets, fresh look at your service offerings, and then using dashboards and reporting to find what I call hidden gems in any organization. So let's look at some industry data. If you look at the Service Council, in the recent survey they stated that revenue is at the top of your agenda if you're a service leader, closely followed by reducing costs, and then improving satisfaction and increasing productivity. And again, if we look at industry experts, such as Gartner, Aberdeen Group, the TSIA, and so on, they're all saying the same thing. There are three real main drivers in any service organization. And the first one, and the priority really, is to drive the service revenues, then to look at things like loyalty and satisfaction, and then ultimately to improve operational effectiveness and productivity in any organization. And you know, this slide kind of sums it up for me. You're the service leader. You've just come out of the boardroom where the CEO has indicated what he's looking for for this fiscal year. This graphic pretty much sums it up. You know, at the end of the day, how do you increase revenue, get that productivity up, make customers happier, and do all of this while reducing operating expenses? You could argue it's the service leader's dilemma. So before we go any further, we want to conduct a poll. And you'll see a poll now hopefully come up on your screens. And I'm just really interested in your view as service leaders on this particular web, webcast. So if you look at the questions, we're asking you, what do you think works best to drive service revenue? So is that really upsell and cross-sell to your existing customers for things like new products and services? Is it service competitor products? So when you look out there and you see your competitors in the marketplace, do you see that as an opportunity for your business to ultimately drive additional revenue? Perhaps you're looking at operational efficiencies such as dynamic route scheduling or trying to improve things like your first-time fix rate, all of those hopefully giving you better um, profitability for your organization. Or perhaps you can see adjacent markets within your space, 
where you feel you've got the skill sets within your existing uh, technician workforce to maybe break into new markets and look for additional opportunities. So at that point, I'd like to understand what your views are, and hopefully in a second, uh, Sarah will feed back to us and let us know what the results of that poll question are. Yeah, Dave, I think we can go over those now. Uh, it looks like um, about 38% of the audience uh, says that they feel upsell and, and cross-sell new services and products works best. 19% uh, said service competitors' products. 33% improve operational efficiency. And 10% uh, enter new markets. Terrific. OK, Sarah, thanks for that. Um, um, guys, thank you very much for, for um, answering those questions and the poll questions. It's interesting that we're saying upsell and efficiencies are the two main areas that you as service leaders are looking at within your own business. So hopefully I'll touch on some of those points as I move further into the presentation. So I guess you could argue what I've said so far, I almost become Captain Obvious in all of this. I don't think there's anybody out there with wildly different targets than the ones we've already discussed. And you may believe, well, I've just wasted five minutes of your life there, but I hope not. I'm hoping for me it's important that we understand the dynamics of the service organizations of the day. And really, as Confucius says, you know, I want to set expectations here with you. For me, there's no magic bullet. I'm certainly not a rocket scientist, but what I want to do is share with you my experiences of what I've seen in field service organizations, and particularly field service organizations that have adopted the ServiceMax tool and how they've seen additional benefits. So I hope that Confucius' words don't come back to haunt me. But as I say, we've seen real changes in companies that utilize mobile technology and cloud-based technology. And I do recognize that different companies have different strategies in terms of where they make their revenue. So this isn't a one-size-fits-all. What I'm hoping to do here is show you industry data, show you some examples of revenue-generating ideas, and then hopefully at the end we'll have a Q&A session. And we can talk about what those options are. So, what I want to do now is talk about how to utilize what I consider is your greatest asset. And really, this is a dummy poll question, so please don't feel like a question will pop up in your screen at the moment. But what we're really saying here is, what is your organization's biggest asset? And we kind of gave you three options at the beginning, the technician you have, or the technology you have, or the tools you have. And I guess what I'm all hoping you'll point to is the fact that one of the biggest assets in any organization is absolutely our technicians. And let me try and explain why. Because for me, when you look at your technicians, you need to understand that in the US alone, there are 5.4 million service technicians and 6.2 million salespeople. These are just the US numbers. Imagine adding EMI and Asian numbers to that as well, just to understand the size of this opportunity. So 5.5 million service techs, and we know from research that only 43% of companies say they have a strategy to use those techs to sell contracts or provide leads for sales and consumables. So that really struck me. I thought, wow, that's 2.16 million technicians in the US just waiting to be switched into what I consider is revenue generating mode. And if you think about it, these people are the eyes and ears and face of your brand. They come into contact with your customers multiple times in the life cycle of the product. And for me, that just can't be underestimated. We have a gold mine sitting right under our noses. So let me try and quantify that. For me, technicians are trusted advisors. They have a trusted advisor status. But do we use them correctly? So I may be oversimplifying terribly here, but for me, when you look at the math, it makes incredible reading. If we just get one additional dollar in additional revenue a day per technician, we generate over $1.25 billion a year. Just imagine if that were $5 or $10 each. So do we really utilize our best resources, those trusted advisors? You know, a comment from a global service leader from GE Oil and Gas stated that a cross-trained field service engineer with a high first-time fix rate and soft skills capability is gold. Smart service companies are investing and training in these areas. So I guess I'm asking the question, are we investing in our trusted advisors? So. Think about it. What is your greatest asset? It has to be your service technicians. They exemplify the values of your business. You know, in, in particularly in capital equipment service, contact from sales teams can be infrequent. And the service teams are the conduits of your business to your customers. Every contact of every employee with a customer is an opportunity for revenue growth. Service technicians can discover things like patterns and timings of demand for replacements of products. 
They can drive consumable sales, and they can add to your competitive knowledge database. So do we really use them as we should? Well, let's look at some more research. You know, for me, times are changing. Techs have been made to realize now that they add significant value in an organization. Well, half do. You know, as I say in a recent survey, when companies were asked the question, do you have a strategy in place to motivate your field service reps to directly sell services or provide leads? 42% yes said yes, they had a strategy in place, or they were implementing a strategy. And 15% said they had a strategy. You know, 19% were working on it, and 24% no, said no. So, you know, that means just over half were implementing a strategy, and the other 43% were just work in progress or no plans whatsoever. Isn't that a terrific opportunity for your business? So now I'm going to launch what I consider is probably my most controversial slide. And I assure you, I'm not here to offend anybody by this slide. But you know, for me, many years ago, a very large Pitney Bowes customer said this to me. And it resonated with me quite profoundly. She said it without hesitation and was quite serious. She said, if the salesperson told her she needed a new machine, she would just plain ignore that advice. She would ask a nice technician who would absolutely tell her the truth. These guys really are trusted advisors. So let's have a look at an example. You know, I'm going to shamelessly, I guess, plug the ServiceMax product here, as I guess you would expect me to. But I think I'd like to look through that and just show you the power of an intuitive uh, user interface. So let's look at how we can support revenue growth. Now here's a screenshot of an iPad application. So we can build interactive and intuitive solutions into the product that allow you to capture all the revenue opportunities through your greatest asset, your service technicians. On the left there, you can see where the engineer can hit the sales and marketing tab and place a sales lead instantly without fuss and with full track and trace. You know, if you think about it, gone are the days where techs bemoaned the salespeople were not accepting their service leads because they were, quote, already in the system. Now there's full track and trace of all leads. And if you have a simple lead system in place for upsell or cross-sell, or indeed sales leads, and consumable sales leads, you will proactively drive the behavior of service technicians. You can also see there, there's a menu for the tech to load details of third-party consumables. And the customer may be using those and using a competitor product. In this case, we've used it for toner leads, as an example. I've seen some companies who are now having sales lead submission as a fundamental part of a technician's performance review. Wow, that's a real fundamental difference in an organization and how it thinks. Take a look at this screen and just ask yourself the question, how much would it cost to have your system, your IT system, have this build it for you? Isn't it better than using a technician to write down a sales lead on his hand and hoping that that night he remembers to put the sales lead in and doesn't scrub his hands? You know, think about competitor database. You know, revenue comes in all shapes and sizes. Generating revenues from the sales team should ultimately generate service revenues as well. Well, here's an example where we can generate well-qualified information on competitor equipment at really zero additional cost for your organization. For me, this is another smart way of generating new opportunities for both our sales colleagues and for the service organization to boot. Just multiply your text by one qualified lead a day. And imagine your sales folks with up-to-date, superbly qualified information from your service guys. When they make a call to the customer, they have a great data set to open up a conversation. How much do you spend in your business generating quality leads for your, your sales organization? Remember, every qualified converted lead usually delivers a really juicy service contract with it. You know, another area of focus should be attached rates for me. Does your service organization have a clear bond with your sales team? You know, a service contract that isn't signed at the point of sale is a massive revenue, revenue opportunity lost. If you take industry data in the hardware space, Best-in-class organizations achieve a 90% contract penetration rate, and it's 100% for software companies. But unfortunately, the industry average is only 67%. Now, I've seen best-in-class companies reduce commissions for salespeople if they don't sign a service contract up at the point of sale. And I just wondered if you do something similar. Again, if you look at the IDC reporting, it clearly references that 70 to 90% of the lifetime cost of equipment 
is in maintenance and repair. And if you lease equipment, then a bundled service contract will be for the duration of the lease. And again, this is a great way of securing long-term revenues. Also, can you track warranty and warranty periods in your system? Do you have a mechanism to proactively call on your customers at the end of a warranty period and offer them a chance to take a service contract? Are your time and materials rates so competitive that it's more advantageous for a customer to not take a contract and risk the breakdown charge? Can you use your trusted advisors to sign customers into a service contract when they install or make the first visit? And now with our new Smart Docs application, as you can see here, there's the ability to capture a customer signature so you can get engineers to potentially sign customers for new contracts, for upsell, cross-sell, again, all done through their iPad application. Another great way of generating additional revenue for your organization. Of course, not all services need to be physically connected to the device or even related to repair service. So for example, companies that equip service technicians with information and tools to sell relevant items, such as consumables, experience a higher affinity to the consumables of their brand and an increase in sales. And what I want to do now is to share a story with you as a customer example. This is from Pitney Bowes. And um, about a year ago, I went out with an engineer to do a service visit, and we were doing an installation of a brand new product. And we'd also done some um, research and understood that uh, the ink that we were selling in our particular postage machines was very much under attack by competitors and uh, compliant products. So we educated our engineers and let them know about the issue with selling inks, about their ability as the trusted advisor, and really the margins that we were making as a business on the ink and how important it was to us. And I really saw an engineer in that trusted advisor status do a really great job with the customer. I'd like to share that with you. Before doing that, when we sat down with the guy who actually headed up uh, the consumable business within Europe, he came to me as the service leader and said, how can I get your service engineers to sell more? And I said, it's really easy. We need a simple system for them to place an order, and we need to keep it simple, stupid, use the KISS methodology. In other words, we needed a very simple incentive scheme for the engineers, and we decided on 10% would be it. So the engineer did the installation for the customer and said, you know, at the end of the installation, when you get the ink with this particular machine, it's not a large bottle, and due to your volumes, you're going to need some more. So can I order you some more ink, to which the customer agreed to. Now, those of you on the phone were probably saying, well, you'd have got that order anyway, and you'd be absolutely right. But then I really watched the engineer sell to the customer in a truly terrific way. What he said to the customer next was, you know, do you have a problem with return mail coming back into the wrong department? And the customer said, yes, we absolutely do. That's a big issue for us. And he said, you know what, with this new machine, I can turn on the return indicia so it prints your address on the envelope. Would you like me to do that? The customer said, that would be fantastic. Of course, the engineer enabled that for the customer. But of course, what did they need? They needed additional ink because, of course, it would consume more ink. He took another order for ink from the customer. The next thing he talked to the customer about was having their logo on the envelope. Again, the customer contacted their marketing department. They loved the idea. The logo was sent down in PDF format, and the engineer loaded it on the machine. What was the benefit there? Well, it was two different colors, so we needed to order two different additional colors for that particular customer. That engineer that day picked up a $1,000 ink order for Pitney Bowes. And when you think about it all around, Pitney Bowes won because they got a great ink order, but the customer was, was delighted because they saw additional functionality in the machine and they felt they were taken care of and they saw the true value of the product. And for me, that's a terrific example of when you get an engineer switched into that trusted advisor status and you have the correct tools to support them, you can see some fantastic improvements in your top line revenue. Let me give you another example. This is a company called McKinley Equipment, and they make elevators and lifts and so on. They have a program they call Dash One, and it's an incentive program designed to get McKinley's tech to upsell services or look for quote opportunities for more complex jobs, such as installations and so on. You know, the CFO, Kevin Rusin, there said to me, there's nothing I'd like to do more than to pay out dollars to my techs in the Dash One program. Kevin's the CFO. I mean, for those service leaders on the phone, who ever heard of a CFO being happy to pay out dollars to anyone? You know, their previous incentive system was paper intensive, and thus it was very, very labor intensive to track. And if you made a mistake, you really do lose credibility with technicians because they're very much people who, once they feel there's an incentive in place, you need to come through with your promises. Now it's all done automatically within ServiceMax. And at month's end, 
Kevin runs a report that's done automatically, and he cuts checks. But what a dynamic for them, because it's adding extra dynamic to their business. They're encouraging other technicians who want to come and join McKinley, as the pay differential their technicians are earning now is beginning to be noticed in the marketplace. You know, Kevin said to me, we have techs in the pipeline wanting to come to work at McKinley. They want to work on the latest technology, such as iPad on our mobile devices. They want to earn more money, and they want to be part of a growth company. In, in Q3 2013, McKinley have seen a 47% rise in revenues, 47%, and over half of that has come from their Dash One program. You know, if you get the incentive right, and you have a tool that facilitates a streamlined process, you can generate additional revenues, as the McKinley case shows. And you may well drive benefits you haven't even considered, as Kevin is. So what I want to do now, if I can, is move away slightly from the trusted advisor status and talk about how to take a fresh look at how you do business in the pursuit of additional revenues. You know, this chart is testament to the fact that leading companies are thinking about service more holistically and strategically than before. For these companies, service is not limited to cutting costs or honoring warranty obligations. It's becoming strategic, and it's ready to play a key role in helping companies achieve their strategic and revenue goals. For me, the days of mergers and acquisitions driving growth have been overtaken, really by CEOs realizing the gems that sit within their own organization. Developing compelling new service offerings is a key element to growth, and your service organization is a gem. Companies realize that while equipment service is critical to brand loyalty, and product differentiation. It also offers, for me, an excellent source of revenue. Service revenue not only carries a high profit margin, but also, when delivered through long-term contracts, offers a predictable annuity stream that attenuates the periodic painful trough in sales. Again, research shows that best-in-class companies have a 97% renewal rate, and these companies work hard to give their customers a compelling reason to continue with their service. This is achieved by constantly innovating and developing those, their service offerings. And for those of you after this call, go and Google the word servitization when you get a minute. I think you'll find the article very interesting indeed. So how do you differentiate and grow? Well, for me, companies recognize that margins are being squeezed and that their service may be becoming commoditized. Smart companies are diversifying, offering customers differing service levels and choice. And product companies are looking at scorecards, and they must excel really in three key areas if they hope to protect and grow annuity service revenues. They need to look at attaching service contracts to the initial product sales. They need to look at renewing annuity-based service contracts, and also selling new service contracts that are not related to recent product transition. So let's talk about annuity streams. For me, service revenue not, carries, not only carries a high profit margin, but also when delivered through long-term contracts, offers a predictable annuity stream. This attenuates these per periodic peerful troughs that I've mentioned before. And for me, this is absolutely one of the reasons why CEOs are now waking up and seeing the potential within their service business. So my questions to you are, do you measure attrition in your contact, contract base? Do you understand why your customers choose to leave you? Do you have a compelling value proposition? Have you refreshed your service offering? And can, through your systems, can you measure and thus understand the loyalty drivers within your business? What I want to do now is concentrate on dashboards and reporting uh, to look at what I consider hidden gems. You know, my next slide often makes people chuckle, but I'll try and explain. You know, when CEOs are demanding performance from their services businesses, you know, service is a real business. It's not a cost center anymore, very much becoming profit centers. And it needs to have data and factual information real time. You can't conduct your business anymore in the old-fashioned way. How many times as service leaders have we wished for real life data and not been able to get it? In effect, we've been pulled over by the cops before we realized we actually have a problem. I mentioned before McKinley and the CFO at McKinley, Kevin Rusin. You know, let's have a look at how he uses his dashboard to track the revenues on both sides of his business. How many of you can track your revenues day by day or even hour by hour? How many of you get to the end of the month and are told a revenue number 
and then it's a real holy cow moment because we've missed our numbers. You know, when you look at Kevin's dashboard here, not only can he see revenue from both sides of his business, he can see the trends on that revenue and see if it's growing, but then on the, on the right-hand side of his dashboard as well, he also has operational metrics that he uses so we can understand not only how he's doing fiscally, but operationally as well to make sure that his SLAs have been met for his, for his customer. So we have a revenue um, opportunity there, as it were, where we can measure, but we also see a quality measure at the same time. It's a really excellent dashboard. You know, for me, this is another great example. This is a service company based in Europe that had an SAP ERP system. And what they did is they looked at all of their assets within SAP and cross-referenced those with all of those assets that had a service call in the last 12 months. And that little blue cheese block you can see there of just over 3,000 assets are the assets within over 34,000 assets they have here that actually had had a service call in the last 12 months. And what a powerful opportunity that is. Because with that opportunity, they can then reach out to those customers and talk to them about, hey, would you like a health check on your machine? Where are you ordering your spare parts from? Would you like to sign up for a preventative maintenance agreement and so on? So for me, this is a great example of taking two systems, in this case SAP and ServiceMax, co-mingling the information together, getting a really important report out of it, and then driving additional revenue opportunities for your organization it, just by having the power to be able to manipulate that data with the tools that you have. You know, for me, we now come to what I consider is the jewel in the crown, the entitlement codes. This is what the customer is entitled to versus what the customer is really paying for. You know, in my travels and I go and visit lots of customers, I see T-card systems and whiteboards, Excel spreadsheets, warranty tracking on thousands of bits of paper. The customer original contract is stored away in a filing cabinet where nobody can remember it is. You know, when you think about it, your technicians need to be crystal clear about what the customer's contract is entitled to. Do they pay for travel, parts, and consumables? Are they paying for preventative maintenance? Are they in warranty? Are they out of warranty? And I would ask yourself as service leaders to ask this question. If there's a doubt in a service technician's mind to charge or not to charge, which one do you think they'll do? If you look at this slide here, you can see there is a section there for warranty dates. There's an entitlement code. Click on the left-hand side in the orange bar there, and you can clearly see that the engineer is clearly informed when the contract is valid from and to, what the warranty periods are. Are wearable parts covered as part of this contract? Zero. No, they're not. Is labor covered? Yes, it is. Is travel covered? Yes, it is. Are parts covered? Yes, they are. And also, there's additional functionality in there. If a customer wants to buy just a series of preventative maintenance calls, maybe for a year, or perhaps they want to buy 20 hours of support, all of that can be catered for within the entitlement and warranty tracking costs within the system. You know, I mentioned before about warranty tracking in my last slide. But again, with intuitive reporting, you can understand all your warranty costs, whether they be travel, labor, and in this case, spare parts. But just imagine if you were servicing on behalf of another equipment manufacturer, to be able to get this level of granularity, to be able to go back to your suppliers and tell them what the cost of poor quality is, what the cost of the warranty period has been for your organization, rather than trying to put a discount perhaps in place for the original contract that you've signed with them, you can really start tracking this information to the minutest detail. And information is power in these kind of examples where you can go back to these suppliers, tell them exactly what warranty is costing you, and then have a, a negotiation with them in terms of how you want to be recompensed for that. You know, I know I highlighted that entitlement is, is easy to understand with the iPad app, but you know, there are examples when an engineer decides that he doesn't want to bill a customer, and these could be quite um, reasonable uh, requests. It could be, for instance, an engineer has gone back on a recall on a chargeable call and hasn't fixed the issue first time round. So there are examples where you are going to have to let the engineer potentially override the system, even though the system says it's a billable call, the engineer wants to force a non-billing activity. And again, you can see here on the iPad how easy that is to do. However, the difference is that through intuitive dashboard and reporting, where an engineer has overridden the system and made the call non-billable, this will now not go straight through the system as a non-billing activity. But it can be held in an exception queue, as the manager will need to sign off any non-billing activity going forward. 
Now, this is a dashboard to control how often this happens and by which technician. And there's full drill downs available here, so you can click on these and go into individual technicians and individual work orders as necessary. And really understand which managers are managing these forced free of charge behaviors within the technicians and which ones aren't. So again, it gives real granularity for a service leader and really allows you to stop those revenue leaks that go into an organization. You know, for me, these types of controls stop those revenue leakages and ensure that you really have a tight rein on your bottom line as a service leader. You know, I also think about those incidental costs that can stack up in most businesses. Often these get what I call lost in the weeds. And in this particular case here, we're showing examples of incidental costs such as things like phone support, travel charges, hotels, parking, and so on. All of these can be tracked using ServiceMax. And again, this gives you a fantastic way of controlling those costs, or at least understanding those costs. And, and you know, it's a great example of you controlling additional revenue for your organization, and particularly controlling costs at the same time. So you know, as I said at the beginning, I'm not here to preach or proclaim that I have all the answers. But for me, what I will say is that with service being in the spotlight, we should group together as service leaders and share best practice with one another. You know, within ServiceMax, we have forums such as our customer advisory board and user groups that help us to do this. But I would leave you with these four, what I consider are vital questions for any service leaders. And the first one is, do you use your best resources for revenue generation, your technicians? Do you invest in soft skills training and have incentives in place that drive revenues. The second one is, do you use all the resources you have at the point of sale to ensure you have those industry-leading attach rates? Remember, early contract penetration equals long-term revenue gains and that vital annuity stream, which is the lifeblood of any service organization. The third one is, do you measure contract retention? Are you in control of retention? And do you have a compelling reason for your customers to re-sign with your organization? And finally, what I call those dollars on the floor in your company. Do you have entitlement leakage or warranty leakage that you can bind shut through systems and training and ultimately deliver top line revenue growth? You know, for me, our customers have asked themselves these questions and determined that ServiceMax was part of that revenue equation. So what I want to do now is hand you over to my colleague, Vija, who's going to share with you some of the results our customers have seen using ServiceMax solutions. Vija, over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. Welcome, everyone. My name is Vidya Chidaga. I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at ServiceMax. Ah, oh, that's a hard act to follow, Dave. Thank you so much for that, um, uh, the wealth of knowledge that you've imparted. Uh, I just have three slides, folks. I just wanted to call out um, uh, the survey results that we had. So we surveyed our customers start of this year. Uh, I think this, this result is from 55 or 52 customers. And uh, just to assess the, the true impact of ServiceMax, and you can see this, this, this chart right here talks to itself. It's, uh, you, I just want to call out the service revenue, a 14% average increase in service revenue. I'm blown away by, by the fact that there are outliers who had a 38% increase in, in service uh, revenue and 50% and increase in service revenue. Uh, and and if, I, if I have to peel the onion and look at some of the things that Dave spoke about, where he spoke about field service organizations growing service revenue by capturing the overlooked service revenues, providing entitled services, cross-selling other products and services, and, and, and using superior service as a differentiator and a selling point. So when we asked our customers, within the service revenue increase, you can see that um, things that accounted to this increase were preventing the warranty leakage. It was targeting newer markets. It was about using service plan templates and productizing your service offerings. It was about providing the 360-degree visibility, thereby able to upsell and cross-sell. I mean, 38% of you said that is important and that is what you think of when you think of growing your service revenue, so that's super critical. Um, the one-click close of uh, work orders that absolutely speeds up the cash flow, and your CFO is excited that he's got money in, in the bank faster than he'd expected. He, think about increasing attach rates and renewal rates to so service max actually 
has, has helped our customers improve service revenue. And I'm just talking to the second green arrow you see here. Uh, the 14% increase is, is attributed to the various uh, elements of this end-to-end -end complete field service solution that we have. Um, this, this is my favorite, uh, you know, like the entire product offering slide. Uh, we, we have everything right from contracts, which is installed base management, entitlement and warranty management, service plans is huge. We launched a big uh, product release around this. It's around service uh, offerings and preventive maintenance checks and building all the pricing constructs and discounting into it. So there's a reason why service contract belongs in the front office versus being tucked into the back office ERP system. Then you've got scheduling. It's around work order management and advanced scheduling, be it manual dispatch or um, interactive dispatch through a dispatch console. Then there's the workforce optimization. We have Optimax, which is, um, which is an engine that runs, that helps optimize your large workforce and just make sure that you get the right technician to the right job. Not just that, but this person is equipped with the right tools, right parts, the right context to be able to use social collaboration and our cutting edge mobile technology to, uh, to contact an expert in the back office to, to improve the first time fix rates. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Um, parts, parts is, is, is such a strong module from ServiceMax. We've got two arms of service uh, strategies we cater to. You could have um, a field service strategy or you could have a depot repair and returns management strategy, wherein you say, that a field service technician is not dispatched. Instead, I want my items, uh, uh, I, I want my customers to return it because it's a high value item. So there's reverse logistics and forward logistics and all of that built into our um, service supply chain module. Then we've got social, which is built on the power of chatter from salesforce.com. Um, and and um, uh, that, that just reminds me to tell you guys that we are native on Ford.com and um, we use all the, uh, all the uh, bells and whistles provided by Salesforce on the Ford.com platform and social is, is one of them. We, uh, we are built on Chatter. We've got collaboration for the field technicians, ticker feed and, and, and service pulse for executives and managers. We've got product pulse which is so interesting. It's intriguing to have this machine-to-machine -machine communication, remote machine uh, monitoring, and so on. We've got the portals, which is the lens uh, for a customer or a partner into uh, the, 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 the cases or work orders or outstanding items, knowledge items, you name it, and you can decide to put it on the portal. All this built on our cutting-edge mobile technology um, we've got an iPad app. We've got ServiceMax Mobile on laptops, which, which, is, um, um, which is just newly released. We've got smartphone capabilities and so on. Um, so I just wanted to call out our end-to-end -end solution. And it doesn't end there. Uh, the webinar ends in a few minutes, but you can go to servicemax.com. Tons of additional resources. I love listening to some of the recorded webinars. There are case studies, customer testimonials, both in the form of print and videos. Uh, we spend a lot of time and effort on our white papers and data sheets. I love the infographic. All the customer results I presented two slides before, it's in a wonderful infographic. You can share it with your colleagues. You can look at it in detail. And uh, before I wrap up, I just want to say we look forward to seeing you at Dreamforce. For those of you who can join us next week, and um, with that, I would just thank you for your time. And over to you, Sarah, for uh, Q&A. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, and thank you, Dave. Uh, both of you uh, gave some great information. And we have a few questions here that I want to go over. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, one question at a time generally and give you both a chance to respond if you'd like, because I know you both have some great insights to share. Um, so the first question is asking, how you make sure your technician doesn't go from the trusted advisor that we talked about to a sales guy, quote unquote, when they start selling? 
Uh, great question, and I think it's probably the, the biggest question that gets leveled at me when I make this presentation. And um, I've had quite a few customers come up to me after presentations when I've done physical presentations in front of an audience who, who've kind of battled with this dilemma, and, and I, I do share people's concern. So what I would say, first of all, is that, you know, for me, a service technician, I would argue, is an opportunity finder and not a salesperson. That's really what you want them to do is to really open up opportunities for the organization. Not necessarily to sell, but of course, if there is a soft sell opportunity, then they can go for it. I, I would advocate we absolutely do not want to destroy the trusted advisor status of the engineers. And I'd hate to think that any organization would consider, for instance, a sales target for a service technician. I think that would be a, a very dangerous move for any organization to make for obvious reasons. So, you know, I would argue that simple order processing is required for a service technician. You need to make sure the te technicians are well rewarded, and then you will get them switched on. I think companies have to recognize that not everybody is going to be a salesperson. Some service engineers will, will flatly refuse to do any kind of selling whatsoever. Even though they do actually sell, they just don't realize they're doing it, but they hate it to be labeled. And I don't think you can switch on everybody, and I think you just have to reconcile yourself with that as a service leader. So pay the technicians. Absolutely, that's one way to destroy any kind of incentive you put in place. And I think ultimately the last thing for me and probably the most important thing is, you know, in a recent survey when CEOs were asked the question about, you know, utilizing their service engineers in this trusted advisor status and did they get them to sell, you know, a lot of them said they thought it was really important, but only 10% of them said they were actually investing in those soft skills. And that for me is a huge disconnect in any organization. So I think, you know, I used the Pitney Bowes story before. We saw what was going on at McKinley. They've got great tools to be able to help them do this stuff. And what you've got to do is get those engineers engaged, give them the soft skills training, make the connection for them, and you really can turn on what I consider is a huge revenue generating uh, organization and opportunity for your business. Okay, great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Vidya, did you have anything you wanted to add uh, on that point? I'm good, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Dave, the next question for you is, uh, what is the top metric that you, as a former service leader, wanted to know or track for service revenue? Yeah, again, great, great question. Um, I, I, think, I think the answer is um, multifaceted here, um, and I think it really depends on, on your own service business. But, you know, for me, um, within Pitney Bowes, uh, we, we had, had 600,000 customers in Europe, so we saw on, on probably a 20% churn of our base on every year. So I was very much looking at things like uh, the renewal rates of those existing customers to make sure that we re-sign them into a new three or five year lease and term. I would also look at whether we'd increase the value of that service contract at that point of sale or whether it was devalued because obviously that would have a long term impact. I'd certainly be looking at attrition rates and losses of customers and trying to understand why we're losing them and the effect on the revenue streams. And particularly for me, uh, attach rates for new customers. So, you know, that's the new revenue streams, particularly where we're going in and taking out competitive equipment. So those attach rates were really important to me, but, but also needing to understand uh, what, what value we got at the point of sale. So how close to list and service prices were we getting and how much discounting was in place. So I used to get reporting that would show me what kind of discounting rates we would get. But, you know, I guess I was pretty blessed in some cases. I did have some reports and extremely frustrated in others that some reports weren't available to me. And I guess there may be a lot of people on the phone right now listening into this who are frustrated as well because they can't get to a lot of the information they need. One of the things that I think is also important when you look at revenues is if you, if you set up a new incentive, and we've talked about this whole cross-sell, upsell, trusted advisor status, you know, one of the things that particularly impressed me is that when you set something like that up as an opportunity, you can quickly um, you know, put a report and a dashboard together so you can see very quickly what's going on. And again, I think historically people have put incentives in place, and it's really taken them two or three months for the information to kind of percolate through the system for them to understand whether what they've set up has had an impact in their business from a revenue perspective or not. You know, the great thing about having intuitive reporting online, which is available 24 hours a day, and it's instantly updated, is you really do see those reports and dashboards giving you instant feedback on what's going on in your business. If you've changed something, you can ultimately see what that change has had in terms of an effect on those revenue lines. And if it's not working, 
then of course you can very quickly get underneath it, understand not, what's not working, and then make the changes. So, you know, in summary, I would say it's, it's the typical things that people look at. It's the attrition rates, it's the renewal rates, it's the attach rates, it's all of that kind of good stuff. It's a cheap service pricing, but then also looking at some of the incentives you put in, such as cross-sell, upsell, selling inks, third-party maintenance, and so on, which are, are really, you know, if you like, becoming the, the revenue drivers of the future. So I think, I think for me, Sarah, that there would be uh, what, what I would certainly look at, and those were certainly the reports that I, I uh, looked at very keenly as a service leader. Okay, great. Um, and I think the next question here sort of ties in with that. Uh, just real quick for the audience, if you do have um, any other questions, please uh, go ahead and, and type those in now. Um, so Dave, this next question is asking about reports. Uh, and it, it's a two-part question. Maybe you've, you've addressed the first part, but let me just read it in its entirety. Uh, so it's asking, um, what are the most common field service reports that would help me evaluate service growth? And then uh, the second part is, um, can those reports be built or customized specifically for their business, or are they standard types of reports? OK. Yeah, I, I think the, the common field service reports, I think I've probably already touched upon those. Um, you know, the, the, the attached rates and, and renewal rates and, and um, you know, cheap pricing and so on. I think, I think those are the one. And it really depends on the kind of service business you're in. So that would be my first thing. I think to, to the question, can reports be built, um, you know, are they, are they automatically out of the box or not? Uh, again, I think that's a, a depends question. Um, it depends on really what systems you've got currently. I think with, if I can talk about ServiceMax, you know, one of the things that we say in ServiceMax is that if you put information in, you can get information out. And certainly uh, in my previous on-premise solution I had within Pitney Bowes, it was extremely frustrating because every report that was required usually meant a trip down to the IT department and sitting in front of the IT director and asking him for a report. And more often than not, the team that wrote reports were extremely busy. There were massive priorities in other areas of the business. And some of the timescales and cost of reporting were you know, usually in the months and tens of thousands of dollars. And I think what really impressed me about the whole ServiceMax experience was you know, getting, getting instant dashboard and reporting is, is really quite a revelation in an organization. So I would argue a lot of the reports are out of the box. And when I mean that, not necessarily built by ServiceMax, but you can build them yourself. It's a very simple intuitive platform, as Vigi was saying, built on the Salesforce.com platform. And the beauty of that is that if you've ever seen any reports from Salesforce, you, you know that it doesn't take an IT genius to do these things. You can use administrators and with, with some very basic training, create your own reports and dashboards. Um, you know, when I left Pitney Bowes, in our UK organization, there were a couple of hundred uh, reports and dashboards being used where the service leader in the UK would absolutely maybe have six or seven metrics that he was measuring, but the team may have had a, a plethora of 20 or 30 different things that they were measuring that all lead up into ultimately delivering those six or seven key result areas for the service director. And they built those dashboards themselves. So most of the reporting is available from the suite. There are some complex reports that some customers do ask us for, where we may have to engage our PS team to build those for customers. But I think that they are, they're, they're, they're absolutely uh, the exception rather than the norm. BJ, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, totally. And, and, and just to add to that, Dave, um, we, at, I mean, obviously, from a ServiceMax perspective, we've got out-of-the-box reports as well. And uh, I, could, I could name a few of them. We've got the first-time fixed rate, failure fix analysis, Mean time to report or repair, um, and you know you can you can you can split a big business process. Like we've got reports on efficiency in assignment to scheduling, from inefficiency scheduling to closure, and so on. So uh, we've got I think about 70 plus out of the box reports. And you're right in saying that it's so intuitive to create your own reports, but these 70 plus reports and two dozen plus dashboards help field service organizations to get jump started. So they really don't have to wait even for um, one iteration of uh, the service data to pour in. They can just go ahead and run it right from day one because it's, it's available out of the box. And to your point, it's not, it's not a six-week uh, 
uh, task or a $5,000 drain to get these reports up and running. We've got customers who in the past had to spend four days in a closed room and to come out with one Excel sheet as a report only to realize that the manager looks at it and says, that's not the information what I was looking for. That changed. Go back and run some, some other formulas and numbers for me. So that's not the case with ServiceMax. It's super intuitive. It's drag and drop, all because of the power of the Forge.com platform. So yeah, that, that totally helps. Yeah, Vijay, just on your point, and I think you mentioned it before, that if people visit the servicemax.com website there, there are some great webinars, and I believe there is one on there uh, with reference to reporting and dashboards. So um, perhaps if people uh, can go and have a look at that when they get a minute, I'm sure they'll find it uh, very useful. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question, Vidya, I'm going to go uh, directly to you for this one. Um, it's kind of specific uh, to the, the application itself. It's asking, can you communicate directly from the app to the customer, for example, uh, email templates for follow-up by the technician? That's a great question. Absolutely. The whole point in having a mobile app um, for the technician is that he can do most of the stuff, including communicating with the customer when he's um, maybe delayed for a particular job or um, after the fact wants to email something. A classic example is on the iPad we can generate a pro forma invoice which is branded according to how you want it branded. It's a business output document. We call it the smart business document. And that output document can then be, you can, you can take the signature of the customer right there. So he is, he's validated the use of um, labor, uh, parts, and pricing. And then you can just email it right away to the customer so he has a copy in his inbox you can you can send it to yourself or whatever. So um, we we absolutely have communication with customers via the mobile devices. Okay, great. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, Dave, next next question for you uh, here says: Our trusted advisors have incentive programs in place, but not for selling service contracts. How do we motivate our trusted advisors to sell service contracts or talk about the value of the service contracts? Great question, um, and it's interesting that I understand that uh, so they already have incentives in place, but not for service contracts. So it sounds like they've already switched on their trusted advisors in this case. I, I think for me the answer to that is, is really education. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we're all responsible for revenue in our organizations, and you know, we've just been through probably one of the worst recessions that any of us can remember. And you know, service engineers are not immune to that, and they're starting to understand that really their role is not just about picking up the toolbox in the morning, getting to the first customer site, and completing three or four jobs a day. There's far more to their, their role than that. And one of them is revenue generation. So you know, I would argue that I would probably sit down with my technicians and say, look, you know, here's, here's what's happening to our business. Here is our revenue streams, and here's where we get our money from. And of course, it's the money we receive from our customers, the revenue we receive, that allow us to afford the infrastructure we have, and the buildings, and the laptops, the cars, and, and you guys here in the room. And you play a very, very strong part in that. You know, when I used the comment before, and I meant it very tongue in cheek, about, you know, salespeople tell lies, and the service engineers always tell the truth. I think historically, service engineers haven't really had the tools to be able to sell to a customer. But of course, with the iPad app now, you can put all of the documentation onto the app and allow the, the uh, service engineer to talk the customer through and have a conversation with them about the service contract. And really, who better sometimes than the service engineer? Not just to sell a service contract or renew the contract, but also look to, to upsell the customer, maybe from a, you know, a silver status to gold or perhaps a platinum customer. As I mentioned in my talk, you know, companies really need to look at redefining their service offering and making sure that if it's commoditized, that they offer customers a real value proposition and make it different. So I think if you can change your value proposition, have something compelling, uh, and then train your engineers and help them understand the vital part that they play in the organization, I absolutely think that those technicians can be switched on to, to potentially sell service contracts. So I, I don't think that's out of the question. And uh, you know, I congratulate the organization, whoever they are, for turning on their revenue generating opportunities right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we've been talking quite a bit about uh, the ServiceMax application being used uh, along with the iPad. 
Yeah, yeah, we had a question here I was hoping you could speak to on uh, whether or not the ServiceMax application can be used on Microsoft-based computers as well. Absolutely, totally. Um, as a matter of fact, our laptop app is, uh, is, uh, supports Windows uh, operating system. It's Windows 7 and 8 compatible. We just launched it as a part of our Summer 13 launch, which was a month ago. So it works uh, the same way online and offline on a Microsoft-based computer. Um, and also, on, when it comes to tablets, uh, we've tested our app. Um, we do support the BYOD strategy, bring your own device to work. So technicians may decide to bring a Microsoft-based tablet, and that's totally fine. All they have to do is to fire up a browser, and the app will work just the same because it's all HTML5-based. OK, great. Good. So that clears that up for folks that might be interested in, uh, yes. in the, the Windows-based devices. Good. So uh, we are coming up on the top of the hour, which means that we are out of time for uh, today's uh, presentation. You'll see here on your screen, if you do have additional questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, um, you can send them directly to Dave or Vidya. Their email addresses are right here. Uh, thank you, Dave and Vidya, both very much for sharing your expertise uh, with, with us today. And thanks very much also to everyone in the audience that joined us. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.